G'day, welcome back to the channel. Let's talk remote ID. Let's talk about the FAA's relief. Relief for people who cannot meet the requirements of the second part of the remote ID rule, which comes into effect in just a few short days. In fact, as I make this video, it is 8.30 p.m., actually 8.37 p.m. New York time on the 12th of September. So that's 13, 14, 15, really only three days left before the second part of the remote ID rule comes into effect. And that will require everybody who flies a drone, that includes model aircraft, remote control model aircraft, that weighs 250 grams or more, everyone that flies one of those outside of a freer will have to have a remote ID module fitted or built-in remote ID. That model will have to tell the world where it is and where you are while it's flying. So yeah, and you can't buy the damn modules. They were supposed to cost 50 bucks, and the reality is they cost two or three or four or five times that amount of money and they're just not available. They're not on shelves. You can't just walk into a hobby shop and say, I'll have one of those. They just don't exist at that level of supply. So also uh, the commercial operators, people operating under part 107 will also need remote ID on their drones. Now, newer drones, especially DJI ones, have a built in, not a problem. But a lot of commercial operators have legacy drones. Drones that they bought some years ago still work perfectly well and they use them for like real estate, cinematography, inspections, surveying, all sorts of applications, commercial applications. Now these operators will have to have remote ID on their craft as of the 16th of September. And if they don't, then <laughs> what are they going to do? Now the FAA is aware of this. They've said, well, we're going to provide some relief. We know you guys can't get yourself all set up uh, by the time frames that we've specified. So we're going to provide you with some relief. And I'm thinking, OK, what's that relief going to be like? What form will that relief take? Because a year ago, a whole year ago, exactly the same problem occurred. And the, on the 16th of September 2022, all manufacturers were supposed to be shipping or drones that had standard remote ID built into it. So if you went and bought a ready to fly model airplane or a store bought drone, by law, it had to have standard remote ID fitted and operative if it was made after the 16th of September 2022. And the reality was manufacturers just weren't ready. And that was partly down to the FAA because they didn't tell manufacturers how to do this until the 11th hour. Manufacturers just did not have the time to set up their systems, develop the software, develop the hardware, build it into the system. So the FAA said, oh, Oops, um, OK, we're going to give you an extra three months. The FAA said, we will not be enforcing this rule until the 16th of December, three months after it comes into effect. And, and that worked fine. That seemed to be honky dory. Everyone got around that. That's fine. Different this time. It is totally different this time. And let me tell you why it's so different. First of all, if you're a commercial operator operating under part 107, you're probably going to have insurance. In fact, you should have insurance, right? To make sure that if something goes wrong and someone gets hurt or property gets damaged, then you're covered. You're not going to be bankrupted or, or whatever just because you, you fly into someone accidentally and they sue you for $5 million, right? So you have insurance. The problem with insurance is insurance companies are always looking for an out. They don't want to pay out a dollar more than they have to because every claim that they pay reduces profits. They want to collect as many policy, policy um, payments as they can, but they don't want to pay out any claims. And you probably, if you've dealt with insurance companies in the past, you may have encountered a situation where they try everything they can do to avoid paying you out. If they can find the slightest little technicality, they'll say, I'm sorry, you're not covered, sir. Go away. Um, and there's another problem because all over the world in the last couple of years, there's been a huge level of natural disasters. There's been so much paid out by the insurance companies that they don't have a lot of money left in their pockets. And you might think, well, these, these disasters occurred overseas. You know, we've had the Greek fires and the floods in Europe and the heat wave. You know, a lot of these disasters happened overseas. They won't affect the USA. Well, <laughs> the way the insurance industry works is that each insurer just doesn't you know, cover their own risk. They have a thing called underwriting, whereas insurance companies in different countries will take on some of the risk of other countries. So they swap risk. So basically it means if there's a huge natural disaster in, in perhaps the UK, then American companies will pay some of the costs. They'll pay out some of the claims through the insurance company. It means that you don't have companies going bust, going broke, going bankrupt simply because they were in the area where there was a bad disaster. So the underwriting spreads the risk across the entire world. And one of the problems we have is that US companies have been underwriting companies in other, other parts of the world, and they've had to pay out huge amounts of claims. So that's been a drain on US 
insurance companies. They have been paying out, even though it didn't happen to their policyholders, even though it didn't happen in their country, they're still paying the money out. So they don't have a lot left in the coffers. And if you've got any insurance policies, you'll know the prices have been going up like a skyrocket because the insurance companies have paid out so much money, they've got to claw back, they've got to stay in profit. So they have to put their premiums up. And that means that they are even more so looking not to pay out on any claims. So what does this mean to the commercial and the recreational drone operators as of September the 16th? Well, what's going to happen is the part two of the rule will come into effect. The FAA may say, we are not going to be enforcing this for another three months like they did last year. And people might think, oh, it's great. OK, we've got three months of breathing room to make sure we get our gear up to spec, get the remote ID modules fitted and all that sort of stuff. But no, no, if you're a commercial operator, I can almost guarantee <laughs> that you want to call your insurance company today and find out. Because what may well happen is that if you are flying around commercially operating a drone or even recreationally, you have a problem, you have an accident, you hurt somebody or you damage somebody's property. You go to your insurance company and say, look, I'm sorry, um, we had an accident, I'd like to file a claim. They're going to ask, were you in compliance with all the regulations at the time? Now, if you don't have remote ID fitted to your craft because you couldn't get a module and you're thinking, doesn't matter, the FAA is not going to chase me up, you may find you're not going to get paid out. Your claim is disallowed because you were not in compliance with the regulation. The insurance companies will not care if the FAA are enforcing. They don't care about that. All they want to know is, were you compliant? And if you weren't compliant, they'll probably dismiss your claim because it probably is a breach of the policy conditions that you must always comply with regulations. And if you're found to be flying a craft without remote ID on September the 16th or later, I'm sorry, your claim is denied. So can you afford to take the risk of flying without insurance? I know a lot of hobby, hobby flyers probably will think that's fine, I'll, I'll, I'll just you know take the risk. But commercial operators, maybe they can't afford to. Maybe they have to give assurances to their clients that they're fully covered by insurance before they get a contract. So if that insurance lapses because they are no longer compliant with the remote ID rule, regardless of whether the FAA is enforcing it, they will be in breach of their contract with the people that they're working for. So many bits of details here. So if the FAA just comes out and says we won't be enforcing, that's not relief. It's not relief in the way it was previously because it will, I believe it will invalidate the insurance of everybody that flies and without remote ID. Everyone who is in breach of part two of the rule will lose their insurance cover because they are technically in breach of the rules. And the insurance companies will take advantage of that to deny any claims because they're already way out of pocket with all these natural disasters. So you need to check that. Check your insurance company. Now, even AMA members may not be covered because if you go to your local flying field and it's not yet got freer status and you fly with that remote ID and the worst possible thing happens and someone gets really hurt or property's damaged, I don't see the AMA's insurance company paying out on those claims because you are in breach of the FAA rule on remote ID. That's the bottom line. You're in breach of a rule, therefore you are not covered. Hmm. It'll interesting times, isn't it? Now, one other thing I want to bring up just before I finish this video is back in, I think it was 2016 or thereabouts, the FAA decided manned aviation should have ADSB fitted to their airplanes. They should have ADSB. And you know what they did? They provided a rebate, a rebate, several hundred dollar rebate for everyone that bought ADSB and had it fitted in their aircraft. They were so keen to see people fitting ADSB to their aircraft, they were prepared to pay them money to do that. Now, I think as a community and as an industry, the drone users of America should be saying to the FAA, where's our rebate? We're fitting gear. If there's no benefit to us fitting remote ID, we don't gain anything. It's not our to our benefit. So why should we be carrying the entire cost of it? Now, ADSB was a benefit to the pilots, but remote ID is not a benefit to drone operators. So it's only fair that the precedent that was set with providing rebates for ADSB installations should be extended to providing rebates for remote ID. Even more so because the FAA said it'll cost about $50. And as we know, it's costing two, three, four, five times that. So I believe that the FAA should be paying at least a $50 rebate on every remote ID broadcast module that is purchased. And if not, why not? They've done it before with ADSB, and if it's as important as they say, they should be doing it with remote ID. Anyway, <laughs> that's my video for today. I will be following this very closely if slash when, I'm sure they will, but when they make the announcement from the FAA that they're going to provide relief, I'll do a follow-up video, I'll tell you 
If I think it's good, I'll tell you that it's happened, and I'll tell you how you should perhaps deal with it. Because, as I say, insurance cover could be the thing that completely scuttles the FAA's attempts to say, we've provided relief, we won't enforce. It's not relief to commercial operators or anybody, because your insurance may be invalid. So maybe that's why we haven't had an announcement. Maybe they're scurrying behind the scenes going, what can we do? What can we do? We've stuffed it up so badly. Even if we choose not to enforce, the fact that the rule comes into effect is going to put many commercial operators out of business until they can get the necessary compliant equipment. <laughs> Malicious compliance looms ever larger as one of the reasons that this has happened. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel through Patreon, link in the description, and through channel membership, link in the description. Bye for now. Regulation is like a tumor. It's killing a hobby. It must be terminated. Now!